Space Propulsion Part 1. So we have two series of this um, episodes. The first part will be today um, highlighting air breathing propulsion systems and access to space. Air breathing and rocket engines are the building blocks for future aerospace systems, mankind's adventure of powered controlled human flight started out with piston engines built by Orville and Wilbur Wright. Today's session highlights the beginning of powered flight and moves on to an array of emerging trends in hybrid rockets, energetic fuels, oxidizers, and engines applicable for atmospheric crews and earth to orbit missions. In uh, today's episode, our speaker, uh, Valentina Hessina, she will be covering air breathing propulsion systems. Uh, she's a current PhD candidate in industrial and environmental engineering, and uh, also a vivid uh, show um, participant. Uh, so thanks to her, this, this show is happening. Our second speaker is actually a show, uh, show team member. Her name is Swati Shantran from Finland. She's a research scientist at VTT. She's been with us for now a year, and uh, we also have the privilege for her to uh, present aerospace propulsion elements. And uh, my name is Hien, and I'm second year uh, UNOSA Space for Women mentor. It's an honor and privilege, um, and I welcome everyone to participate in this uh, special episode. And now please welcome uh, Dr. Danielle Delat. She's a senior space system engineer at DRAPA. Uh, she graduated from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, majoring in aerospace engineering with information technology. And she's also an uh, ISU alumni where she completed an interdisciplinary master's in space studies. So I hand over the mic to you, Danielle. Hi everyone, and I'm so excited to, uh, to be introducing our wonderful speakers today. So um, first, Valentina will be, be talking about some of her research and some of the history of this very interesting industry. So Valentina, after studying mechanical and vehicle engineering, is pursuing a PhD in industrial and environmental engineering. As part of her PhD work, she is studying turbulent combustion and pollutant formation in internal combustion engines using computational fluid dynamics. She has a fervent interest in space exploration and propulsion systems, and she has a curious mind, so we are certainly excited to see her here today. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so I will start talking about air breathing propulsion systems on Earth. This means internal combustion engines. And I could have started with uh, a car uh, image, but I will start from a very interesting and particular historical moment uh, that uh, had as a, a main character an airplane and two brothers. Uh, in fact, in 1903, the Wright brothers flew their airplane, the Flyer, and it was fueled and propelled by an internal combustion engine uh, that uh, operated with the gasoline and it was connected to the twin propellers um, by two drive chain which allow the transmission of uh, the motion and the mechanical energy to the two twin propeller placed at the back of the airplane and this uh, historical moment uh, was an inspiration to further develop uh, the internal combustion engine use for aviation purposes of course small airplanes such as this other one which is a more evolved um, airplane that uh, use internal combustion engine and in particular we have three propellers over here there are each one is uh, propelled and uh, by an internal combustion engine which is this particular type of engine and it is called the radial engine since the cylinder the cylinders are placed uh, in this way, so gradually. And the, this arrow points at the output uh, power shaft, which is directly connected to the uh, propeller over here. But enough <laughs> with history. Let's talk about where we can find in our everyday life internal combustion engines. 
Of course, the first thing that comes to our mind is a, a vehicle, a car, for example. And uh, sometimes uh, we use a bike, but sometimes we also use a car to move around our cities or to take a small trip. Other people enjoy driving sports car. And you can find internal combustion engines also on this type of cars. And internal combustion engines allows the um, delivery of food in our shops and by using these trucks on highways. Another interesting application, more fancy, let's say it's the racing, for example, the Formula One competition and other type of transportation uh, that uh, um, employ uh, internal combustion engines are the marine applications, such as the uh, huge cargo ships uh, that are, uh, uh, let's say, uh, they use very uh, a huge internal combustion engine to move uh, goods over uh, countries uh, on water. But you also find internal combustion engines on a small boats that you use to take a trip uh, to the lake or uh, to go cruising around the coast with your uh, families. Another interesting application, which may be more uh, a niche uh, of internal combustion engine, is the stationary power generation uh, for emergency, for example. Um, we can think of uh, hospitals where, uh, of course, an interruption of uh, electrical supply or energy supply uh, would be very critical and we cannot allow that. And in every uh, in hospitals, you can find a stationary power generation that is uh, whose energy uh, is um, produced by an internal combustion engine, for example, in emergency, uh, whenever you have a blackout, for example, and you need power. And now that we have seen a little of history and these internal combustion engines have been used on airplanes, uh, on fancy cars, on uh, ships. Uh, what is the basic um, of uh, the working principle of internal combustion engine? Let's operate a simplification. You have the combustion inside, as the name itself suggests, inside the engine. And then this uh, energy, chemical energy from the fuel is transformed in mechanical energy. Of course, this process is not uh, linear, so we will keep on operating uh, some assumption and simplification. But the main aim here is to provide a brief description of the working principle internal combustion engine. So let's start with um, you have uh, the cylinder, which is a closed environment. Uh, at, uh, that varies its volume. In this cylinder, you will have air and fuel that are compressed during the uh, motion, uh, the piston motion. And once they are compressed at the end of the compression stroke, where temperature and pressure uh, arise, you will have the combustion onset. Depending on the type of engine that you are operating, of course, you may have uh, a spontaneous ignition of the mixture, for example, diesel engines, or you can have a spark plug that will trigger the combustion on the, uh, of the mixture. But anyway, when the combustion onset occurs, uh, the hot burning gases will exert a force on the piston head uh, basically, they will expand inside the cylinder, pushing down the system, uh, the, the piston, and this will uh, be translated into a uh, downwards motion of the piston. And these mechanisms that we can see in the third block of the picture on the right uh, will translate the alternative uh, motion of the piston into a rotation of the crankshaft as we can see from this animation. And the rotation of the crankshaft is somehow the responsible of the mechanical energy that is the output of the internal combustion engine. 
this process is cyclic. It means that uh, it will occur over and over when you are operating your internal combustion engine. And now that we have a little more a clear idea of how uh, the, the magic happens inside an internal combustion engine, we can go and see how the engine will integrate with a system to provide, for example, the mechanical energy to the wheels of a car. And this is a picture I took to the museum in Berlin, the one of the uh, technical museum in Berlin. And uh, sorry, Ian, I don't know how to pronounce this in German. And we can see <laughs> highlighted in uh, yellow uh, the internal combustion engine. And then the output, the mechanical energy um, from the crankshaft is delivered thanks to the drivetrain, which is the complex uh, sequence of uh, mechanisms and transmissions. And they will deliver the power to the wheels that will allow the vehicles to move. And we uh, said that we are talking about hair breathing propulsion. So when we humans breathe, we uh, inhale oxygen and exhale, for example, carbon dioxide, and the same somehow goes for the engine. So it has to breathe out some, breathe out something, and this is the exhaust gases way out. And about what uh, the engine uh, breathes out, breathes out is the uh, pollutant emission, which is a very literally hot topic <laughs> to deal with. And let's uh, to clarify what types of uh, pollutants we may find uh, and that stem from the internal combustion engine uh, operation. Uh, let's take, uh, for example, the ideal combustion, which is fuel and air that reacts. Of course, air usually is made up of hydrogen, uh, made up of uh, oxygen and nitrogen. And the results will be water, yes, water, <laughs> carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, which usually ideally acts as a, an inert, so it doesn't take part in any change. But in reality, you have the ideal uh, products, such as water, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen, but you will also find other types of pollutants um, that are due to the incom incomplete combustion process. For example, you may find um, carbon monoxide, unburned hydrocarbons that may be unwanted. And if the thermodynamics condition are such uh, that can trigger uh, some types of reactions, you may find also nitrogen oxides, which are also dangerous and harmful. But one of the most interesting and harmful species, not only for environmental uh, issue, issues is the soot. You may have uh, also known it as a particulate or particulate matter, but basically what is it? It's um, carbon uh, atom-based structures, and this is a solid particles that is in suspension in the exhaust gases. And some of these particles may be that small that can enter the respiratory system of human, for humans, for example, and causing uh, hazard to our health and not only to the environment. So it's important to study uh, soot uh, formation and carb all the emission as much as possible. And also soot is important, uh, for example, in uh, rocket engines that are um, running with uh, re fuel rich conditions. And this can be an important issue uh, since um, if you have a lot of soot particles produced in the exhaust gas, you will have uh, a change in the uh, thermal uh, heating uh, since uh, a suit has a very strong radiative uh, heating uh, power. And let's go with how can we reduce emissions since internal combustion engines are so widespread and pollutants are a problem. So we can find after treatment of exhaust gases. Basically, we use devices at the end of the exhaust line. So before we, uh, before the exhaust gases exit the system of the vehicle, they will be, let's say, treated. We can also use alternative fuels such as hydrogen and ammonia blends and um, hydrogen itself. It 
still uh, under research this type of fuel, but uh, you also have may have uh, uh, heard about uh, e-fuels. Of course, um, the um, these e-fuels must be produced without um, using edible uh, resources, and they have to be environmental friendly in terms of production uh, process to be considered as a alternatives, promising alternative fuels. And you may also uh, use an hybrid propulsion systems. There is a plethora of uh, configuration of hybrid propulsion systems for vehicles, for, for example, the cars. And the basic idea is to couple an internal combustion engine with an electric motor, uh, of course, uh, depending on the configuration of the hybrid propulsion system, the interaction will be uh, maybe maybe be different. However, the main idea is to um, use the internal combustion engine for extended range of use. For example, if you have to take a long trip out of uh, uh, the, the city, and if you are in the city center to avoid uh, local pollution, you may use the electric uh, propulsion. And of course, uh, increasing the efficiency of the combustion process is one of the most important thing to uh, do, uh, since the uh, pollutant emissions stems from uh, the incomplete combustion process, and increasing its efficiency is key. And not only with experiments and test bench, but also using, for example, simulations uh, that exploits a fascinating tool, which is the CFD, the computational fluid dynamics. And before we go into detail of uh, what can we do with fluid dynamics to uh, further develop uh, internal combustion engine, we can uh, present what CFD is. Um, computational fluid dynamics allow you to use a virtual laboratory where you can uh, simulate uh, a fluid in a system, for example, and you can uh, model and simulate its behavior and evolution using, of course, models and numerical methods. But it's very uh, useful and also a versatile tool since you can um, take advantage of employee computational fluid dynamics for propulsion systems, but also, for example, to uh, study the blood circulations of a human body. There's a lot of studies uh, actually involving the um, human circulatory systems, and they use CFD for medical research applications. And as a final note, this is what uh, CFD can help us in further improving a propulsion systems, for example, in an internal combustion engine. We can model the pollutant formation, the turbulent combustion modeling, and also gain an insight of the best uh, injection strategy, not only for fuel air mixing, but also uh, for pollutant emissions. So it's, it's all... Uh, up to the simulations uh, to discover which one is the better choice. And also we can try to uh, simulate and model the alternative fuel combustion um, of alternative fuel. So it can be a handy tool. And last thing, it's the heat transfer, which is important for internal combustion engines, but also for uh, electric motors. Uh, since there is a current that uh, is flowing in a, in a means, this means that uh, you will have the so-called uh, jowl heating effect. Uh, so the electric motor will heat as long as the current will flow in it from the battery to the motor. So it's important. So we can see that the CFD is really a versatile tool for everything. Uh, and that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Valentina. And we are certainly looking forward to calling you Dr. Fasina in a few years. So we hope your research you. continues to go well. 
And thank you so much for, um, for taking us through that and also highlighting one of the key areas that space has applicability outside of the space industry. So the, the research you mentioned um, also has some, some bio and health applications. I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Swati Chandra. Uh, Swati is a research scientist at VTT. She has aerospace industry experience in CubeSat propulsion systems and pulse detonation engines. And she will be giving a presentation on aerospace propulsion elements and take us through several types of engines used in the space industry. So please take it away. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm gonna quickly share my screen here. All right, um, my name is Swati. I work as a research scientist with VTT. VTT is a Finnish state-owned research organization, and I'm a part of the microspectrometers team. We are currently involved in several deep space missions, and uh, I do a lot of radiation modeling for uh, hyperspectral imaging solutions. I've also had uh, experience working in the aerospace industry with resistor jet technologies and pulsed detonation engines. So without further ado, let's dive into a journey of uh, different aerospace propulsion elements. In general, uh, aerospace propulsion systems can be broadly classified into three types. Uh, we have jet propulsion, rocket propulsion, and in-space propulsion systems. The conventional ones in air-breathing propulsion systems are turbo machinery based, like turbojets, turbofans, and turboprops. For higher speeds, we have duct-based systems, which do not have any moving parts, like ramjets, scramjets, and detonation tubes. In this case, the incoming high-speed jet acts as a compression system. Moving on to the right side of the screen, uh, rocket propulsion elements, they are classified based on fuel choices, such as solid, liquid, or hybrid motors. Liquid rocket engines are more desirable as it can be controlled and restarted intermittently. Then we have in-space propulsion systems, here, the classification is based on the energy source of the propellant, which can range from chemical, nuclear. The electrical ones are the more commonly used ones. And there has also been a significant advancement in propellantless technologies with companies like Tether Dynamics coming into the industry. In today's series, we are only going to cover the jet propulsion and the rocket propulsion elements. First, let's talk about a few terms commonly used in the propulsion sector. The speed of a rocket engine depends upon its thrust. It is basically the amount of reaction or push force the engine provides a rocket. Mathematically, it is a function of the amount of propellant which is thrown out by the engine and the speed at which it is thrown out. ISPs or specific impulse is a measure of engine efficiency. It is a very commonly used term to describe how fast a propellant is ejected out. So in case of engines with higher specific impulse, they consume lesser fuel. This is of significant advantage for space propulsion system where system weights are very critical. Let's now take a look at uh, turbo machinery based propulsion systems. To begin with, what is a gas generator? It is the heart of any gas turbine type engine. It consists of three parts. We have the compressor, the combustion chamber, and a turbine. As Valentina already mentioned, the process of combustion in internal combustion engines, the incoming air is squeezed in the compressor section. This can be thought of how a bicycle pump squeezes air into the tires. This compressed air is then hotter and has higher pressure. And the gas then enters the combustion chamber. Here we have a series of fuel injection ports which inject fuel. The igniters are also housed in this section which ignite the fuel air mixture which is then burnt. These hot gases then move through the turbines 
along their path they spin the turbines as you see the turbines are connected through the shaft to a compressor so a part of the turbine energy powers it powers or spins the compressor blades this is how chemical energy from the burnt gases is converted into mechanical energy the video here highlights the same process now if we add an inlet and nozzle section onto a gas generator a jet engine is constructed here the nozzle expands the jet to higher speed to create thrust and again the turbine is used to move the compressor which squeezes the incoming air the jet engine was invented during world war 2 by a german scientist van ohen from valentina's presentation again uh, we already learned that ic engines do not have very high power hence the jet engine was invented which is more compact and generates higher power compared to traditional piston engine aircrafts one of the systems which flew and is still operational today is the messerschmitt aircraft let's now expand the idea of turbojets a little further turbofans are a more common type of engine you see with commercial wing liners it has an added high tech propeller this is housed inside a duct called diffuser again it has the same operating principle of a gas generator core or a turbojet engine so it has the compressor combustion chamber and turbine in this case you have multiple stages of compressors and even multiple stages of turbines again some amount of the turbine energy is used to power the fan the nozzle in this case consists of an exhaust cone which is designed specifically to mix and accelerate the combustion exhaust another unique feature of the turbofan is that only a fraction of the air passes through the gas generator core a significant chunk goes through the diffuser duct this is referred to as bypass air the bypass here uh, the bypass air here does not undergo combustion or it's not accelerated to high speeds so it is a low speed jet and the major issue with turbojet engines is the jet noise so if there is a low speed bypass air which engulfs the high speed exhaust jet from the core the jet noise is reduced significantly this is a typical case for a commercial jet liner with turbofans turbofans are also used on military jets however in this case they use a low bypass ratio to reduce the size and weight of the system as these engines are meant for high speeds and performance they also have an after burning section this is a small duct pipe between the turbine and the nozzle here fuel is added to the hot exhaust jet which auto ignites and generates more energy so after burners provide a second stage of combustion however it's not very fuel efficient so fighter jets only use them in short bursts that is for take off maybe climb uh, dog fight maneuvers or to speed up military jets also have an adjustable nozzle to maximize the acceleration from the jet and they also provide thrust vectoring so what we have looked at so far is commercial airliners most often use turbofans with high bypass ratio making them heavier and bulkier on the right you see the fabulous f15 with pratt and whitney f100 engines and they have both the afterburners and the adjustable nozzles we just discussed now that we have covered propulsion systems for aviation use cases let's dive into rocket propulsion elements so what we learned so far is in jet propulsion the oxidizer is the air sucked in from the atmosphere whereas for i'm sorry for jet propulsion it is the atmospheric air whereas for rocket propulsion the oxidizer is carried with the vehicle 
The image here is for the SpaceX Falcon 9, which has an array of nine Merlin engines. Let's take a look at how these engines work. Merlin engines carry both oxidizer and fuel. They are stored in the first and second stages of the Falcon 9. For the oxidizer, it uses liquid oxygen. And for the fuel, it's ultra-refined kerosene or RP1. The system here, again, has a gas generator, except in this case, it has a pre-burner, a turbine connected to a shaft, which is again connected to two turbo pumps. The pre-burner section here acts as a mini rocket engine in itself. The same fuel and oxidizer is burnt here, and the exhaust jet then spins the turbine. If you look closely again, the turbine is connected to a shaft, which powers the two turbo pumps. These pumps basically control the supply of fuel and oxygen in the combustion chamber. Now, if you remember for jet engines, we have igniters or for IC engines, like Valentina suggested, we have spark plugs. But for rocket engines, SpaceX did something different. They used small amount of TEB or triethyl boron. This is added in the combustion chamber in very small amounts. It is a hypergolic propellant, meaning it's going to auto ignite when mixed with liquid oxygen. Then the process is again similar to jet engines, meaning there is a thermodynamic expansion of gases at the nozzle, which will produce momentum, thereby causing thrust. Now that we've covered both jet and rocket propulsion elements, the next step would be to dive into in-space propulsion systems. And we have some absolutely stellar speakers presenting on this topic next week. So I really hope to see you all then. With that, I would like to thank our show lead, Hien, and uh, for organizing this session, and uh, Daniel and Valentina for their support. I'm happy to take any questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Swati. Um, so now we get to delve deeper as a panel. Um, so first, Swati, I'd like to ask you, what are some of the unexplored areas in air breathing propulsion systems that could have a big impact on our industry? Um, I think one of the areas which has been researched since the 70s and is not really come to fruitful materialization is rotating detonation engines. They have very high ISPs compared to any other engines out there, but it has never been successfully integrated onto an aircraft and flown. So that would be uh, very interesting to see if, if you know, there is a spin-off or a company which comes up with the concept and is able to uh, have something commercialized in this decade. What do you think the biggest barrier is in, in terms of actually getting that off the ground? Uh, for rotating detonation engines, it's basically the shock wave, which acts as a compression process. And um, again, uh, CFD models are very important to understand how these turbulent shock behaviors work. That has not been very successfully implemented, meaning the engines are operational, but they are not very stable. Thank you. And uh, Valentina, this next question is for you. Um, what is the future potential of internal combustion engines in the aerospace industry? Well, of course, we want to use an internal combustion engine to send a rocket in space, but um, there are some uh, interesting bridges between the technology of IC, IC engines and the propulsion system that are used in aerospace applications. For example, of course, the combustion process, uh, which of course can be different from the internal combustion engine one to the other application in propulsion systems. We have mentioned, for example, particulate uh, or soot, uh, which is important in internal combustion engines in engines for the elf, elf hazard and maybe for rockets uh, rich in fuel, uh, operating rich in fuel can be important in terms of uh, thermal management and uh, operating temperatures. So another interesting thing is um, injection, injection systems. Uh, these systems may be different from internal combustion engines. For example, in internal combustion engine, you may find uh, wine or at, 
uh, two, for example, injectors, if you have a mixed uh, configuration from uh, GDI, for example, a gasoline direct injector, uh, injection or a PFI port fuel injector. So it depends on the system. But in a, for example, in a rocket uh, that is uh, operating with a, a fuel uh, that is a liquid propellant, you may find way more <laughs> injectors. You can have a plate full of injectors. And typically you can find the pintle injectors for the rockets, whereas for the uh, internal combustion engine, an aloe cone is a more common practice. To wrap up my answer, uh, there are bridges between the two technologies and I think that uh, diversity is uh, an interesting uh, thing to apply uh, to further uh, progress and develop uh, technology. So I think that a mutual exchange and of ideas can be interesting to see. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking of that, of new new ideas and, and exchange, um, Swati, um, big rocket companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin are frequently in the news, and rightly so. They're really pushing um, pushing us forward in terms of propulsion. But what are some smaller or newer propulsion companies that are changing the game across the industry? Um, I think one such company I could think of on the top of my head would be Rocket Labs. Their Rutherford engines has been a real game changer. They didn't go about reinventing the wheel, but uh, they basically use the same technologies which has been in existence since the 80s, and they 3D printed their engines. So basically the temperatures with which these engines could last is way higher than conventional systems, and that has been a real breakthrough. Very cool, thank you. And uh, Valet, so when we think about the relationship between industry and academia, uh, academia often doesn't have the same budget as, as the, the big rocket companies, but where can academia still help with access to space and pushing our technology forward? So I believe that uh, the answer is uh, twofold. First of all, education and promoting uh, uh, STEM uh, applications uh, to students, uh, perhaps uh, at the early ages. Uh, so academia can come into contact with the primary schools and they can promote to kids science. Also PhD students <laughs> can uh, do this and uh, have fun with kids and uh, promoting science and uh, engineering. And of course, um, education to engineering students, scientists, but uh, everyone that is uh, interest, interest in accessing the space uh, industry. And um, on the other hand, uh, a collaboration between academia and industry is uh, important uh, beyond any <laughs> uh, measure since uh, industry has the means and the money perhaps and academia may have uh, the methods, the methodology, the knowledge, or just the time, which is uh, the most important resource. Um, since sometimes academia is a fast-paced uh, sector, but not as much as the industry sector. So we may have more time on the academia part to develop or just find new answers to uh, questions and help the improvement of uh, nowadays technologies that are employed in the industry. Yeah, I think that's education and uh, cooperation. I, I couldn't agree more. I know my, my personal first experience with uh, propulsion was on a CubeSat and uh, working on the propulsion system. So it's yeah. it's absolutely vital to to educate and uh, and and inspire our, our young young folks. Um, so the last question I'm going to ask as part of the panel, and then we'll take some as um, from, from our audience, is this is to both of you. Um, I'll ask uh, Swati to go first. Uh, what should people interested in space propulsion look for in space news in the next few years? What's exciting that people should be watching out for? Oh, Swati, I think you're muted. Thank you, sorry. Uh, well, this is quite a tough one to answer, uh, but I'm gonna make an attempt. Uh, I think there have been a lot of missions in uh, deep, space, uh, uh, deep space propulsion, which are 
um, really upcoming right now, like the Comet Interceptor and the Planet Defense Missions. So these mm -hmm. will happen around the period of 2025 to 30, and uh, they would be like real game changers because some of them for the first time would put CubeSats into deep space and that has not been done. It could reduce the cost of these missions significantly. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. And Valentina, what um, what are you really excited that's coming up? Well, uh, as Swati said, uh, the deep space exploration and data collecting, thanks to CubeSat, can be a game changer. And of course, this this is a very thrilling time to be alive and to witness the space sector revolution. Uh, and I believe it's a a blessing to be alive. <laughs> at this time, and um, perhaps also Mars, Mars exploration, maybe not human in the next five years, but uh, who knows, perhaps um, we can start to uh, settle something on Mars and just preparing, <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, let me turn it over to Hien, who I believe has some questions from the audience. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, Dr. Rock, you asked uh, the relation between propulsion and removal of space debris. Who wants to take this one? Go ahead, Swati. Yeah, uh, I think I did have an opportunity to answer this through chat, uh, but there are a lot of companies like uh, Clean Space, which have rocket boosters and uh, really advanced. Um, electrical systems, which will automate the whole process of collecting a space debris and deorbiting it back to Earth. So, but hopefully that might happen in the near decade, uh, but there are a lot of companies working on the same projects and um, others involve tether dynamics to deorbit uh, different CubeSat systems. So it's very much in the pipeline. Uh, can material deterioration from inside body come under pollutant? Um, I'm not sure what they mean. All right, we move to the next one then. Maybe, maybe um, about um, how uh, how some some uh, propellants are uh, deteriorate and uh, erode the inside surface of the rocket more than others. Yeah, I think I think that might be. Um, so, do, do you want to talk a little bit about the the different types of uh, propellant and you know, different types of propellant are good for reusable rockets or good for human rockets. Um, do, would you give a little insight into some of those differences? Swati, do you want to go? Um, yes, if, if I understand the question correctly, we are just talking of material degradation along the walls of rocket engines. So uh, most of these systems already come with like advanced uh, cooling systems to facilitate that uh, the lifespan of the system is really long. And um, especially with the uh, uh, SpaceX on board, most of these systems are reusable for 50 to 100 launches. Uh, so it has not been, uh, but still these materials will degrade after a period of time. Uh, and that has not been the deciding factor, so as to speak, uh, of not using uh, some hypergolic propellants. I, I don't know if I answered it um, or if I understood the question correctly. Maybe there will be a follow-up question. That's yeah. okay. Oh, sure. Um, so um, asking about the percentage of women um, who focus on, propel on propulsion in the space sector. And I suspect this question, the answer to this question depends a lot on where you live in the world. So perhaps um, could you each talk a little bit about the uh, proportion or percentage of women in your work environment? Valentina, uh, would you like to go first and give the academic perspective on this? Yeah, okay. So um, I will go with uh, the education part uh, so when I was enrolled in engineering in my master's degree, about 100 students uh, out of the 10 out of uh, uh, these 100 students were women. So it's 10 percent of uh, women in uh, propulsion, uh, engineering and here in Italy. I'm from Italy, by the way. And but just to uh, work my question a little more and uh, my answer a little more. Um, 
let's say that uh, automotive industry has a very low percentage of women, for example, and all the mobility industry uh, in terms of engineering uh, force is uh, very low on uh, women. But uh, I have uh, I had the chance to meet a lot of uh, incredible uh, engineers, and they were women as well. And so I'm very proud <laughs> uh, because uh, women, uh, the number of women in this industry is rising, and that's a blessing. And I think we this type of um, uh, show, uh, and that's I want to thank Hien uh, for uh, keep on this show, and of course uh, Daniel and uh, Swati. <laughs> Um, it's important to promote STEM uh, among women and just to show that it is possible to do this, no matter your gender. Thank you, Vale. Uh, I'm, of course, the least modest here in the room, making sure that, <laughs> uh, thanks to you, this uh, second year has continued. Uh, are we having any more questions, Danielle? Um, I don't see any more in the chat, but I've got some other questions. Um, so, oh, Swati, go ahead. All right, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I would just like to uh, add on to the same answer um, on what uh, Valentina said, if I may. Um, I was really interested in joining this show series because it turns out there is only 16% of women in the aerospace industry. And you would be surprised to learn that among the 16%, not all of them have technical roles. Most of them are into marketing positions and um, uh, other HR related fields. The very small percentage uh, would, you could really name one or two who would be at the top management level positions. So, the ratios are very, very less, and we really have to make some effort to make sure it doesn't happen in the next generation and motivate more women to join the STEM fields. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't agree more actually with both of you. Um, so I, I think, um, Valentina, one of the things I, I also um, got to observe is 10 years ago, there were maybe a, a much lower percentage of women. I had a chance to audit a, a space propulsion class um, a year ago and right, right before COVID. And I was really impressed by how many more women were in the room. And so I think it is changing in a positive direction. I'm, I'm from the US, so I, I, I can't speak for the whole world, but um, at, least, at least in this one, one program, it, it, was, it was a big difference. And I was, I was really excited about it. So I, I think things like this, and thank you both for your wonderful presentations. Um, I, I think it's really important that we, we keep getting out that message. There are women in the space industry in propulsion, and we're very excited about the work we do. So, it's, um, so thank you both so much for being here. And um, so for a next question, um, what is your favorite rocket and why? Swati, do you want to go first? Um, okay. Um, I would say it is the um, SR-71. I personally think there has not been an engine built which could really compete with that. Uh, it has been an engineering marvel and an inspiration to even look at the design. It is a coupled system between a turbojet and a ramjet. Um, it's still in operation. Maybe one or two units are still active there. And I, I hope more systems come up like that. And Valentina, have, how about you? What's your favorite rocket? Yeah, I have a less technical quest, uh, answer than a Swati. Mine is more like, uh, which one is the rocket that sent a car in the space? <laughs> it's the Falcon Heavy in 2017. So I will go with Falcon Heavy. <laughs> no, that's, that's a great one. And um, to kind of continue a little bit on, on the, the theme uh, we were just talking about, uh, what women in space propulsion specifically inspire you? Uh, Valentina, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, to me, it's not just a specific uh, woman. Uh, of course, I am very happy when I see uh, people like Swati, which is incredibly talented and a great engineer and a researcher. And I'm very happy to see that um, 
this tough type of women uh, are thriving in the aerospace industry and I mean just look around and every woman uh, that is uh, pursuing her career in a STEM sector is a, a role model that you can look uh, at so I mean every every woman that is committed and is doing her best in this industry is a uh, is someone that can inspire you inspire you daily and no matter what the achievement so thank you and swati um what women in uh, aerospace propulsion inspire you um thank you daniela for the question and uh, thank you valentina for your kind words it's very encouraging um so I grew up in India and I'm sure a lot of uh, women out there could relate to this. Um, Kalpana Chawla was one of the Indian American astronauts. She has been an inspiration um, and her saga still continues to inspire millions in my country. Um, so following her footsteps, I ended up taking masters in the same university, Texas Arlington as her and her journey has inspired me to come this far. But along the way, I have met a lot of, I've been very fortunate to meet a lot of other great women who have done exceptionally good in my own fields. And it's hard to name all of them in just a one hour show now. <laughs> But it's easy to find inspiration around you um, these days with the social media being um, so easily accessible. And um, I really hope I get to see more women in STEM, at least in the next decade or so. Absolutely. And thank you both so much. So let me turn it back over to Tian um, for the closing. Well, thank you uh, to our amazing speakers. Thank you for your uh, perfect uh, presentation. It sounded like Chinese to me, you know, I was uh, 2019 was at the International Space University. There was the upcoming space engineering. I was very nervous. That's the, the one subject I would struggle and uh, I saw our mentor, I think she was uh, from NASA, some space engineer. Uh, I, I saw her at lunch uh, and there were hundreds of students. I was uh, that's your time now, Ian, to sit down with her and have some private tutorial before you miss the exam. So, <laughs> I mean, um, you mentioned this. Uh, space is really accessible for all. And I don't know why you're watching today and what your background is. It doesn't really matter. Everyone I ever encountered uh, in the space industry was either a space enthusiast like myself and then started to be curious, okay, why not submit to uh, the university or why not reach out to this one person um, I think it's very encouraging just to see women uh, from all walks to support each other um, I think uh, if we all have access to the Wi-Fi now uh, the possibilities are impossible so don't, don't get in discouraged we'd love to hear um, any of your feedback you have for the second part of um, this uh, series. It's uh, it, next week. Um, it's Aerospace Propulsion Part 2, Advanced Deep Space Propulsion Systems uh, with uh, NASA officials, uh, Ms. Holly Ridings, um, and uh, Harold Sonny White. So we hope to see you at uh, this second episode. Let me check if we have any more last questions. I think this is one of the episodes where we're pretty much on time. So thank you so much for your attention and your participation. Thank you, Danielle, for uh, uh, moderating. And uh, uh, thank you, Svati, for co-creating and uh, collaborating on the show and best of luck for our future uh, Dr. Valentina. All the best and very proud for all of your accomplishments.